So this is a long passage. There's a lot going on in here. And it's not really good news there towards the end, right? Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep amidst wolves. So you need to be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. Beware of everything around you because brother is going to turn against brother and father is going to turn against child and children are going to turn against their parents. And you are going to be hated because of me. That's good news, right? Not quite. Not quite. This is an interesting passage. It talks about the the harvest is ready. It's not really the right time of the year, though, for us to be talking about the harvest is ready, right? How many of you are still trying to get the things into the ground so the harvest can get ready? I know several people who have helped other people get their planting done and now are behind because of all the rain. And we're waiting for the fields to be ready. Right? But Jesus is saying the harvest is ready. And what is the harvest? People. What kind of people? Just sinners? All people. Right? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So Jesus tells the disciples to do what? Not yet. He says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Jesus tells the disciples that the harvest is ready and that they, what do they need to do about it? They need to pray. They need to pray to God that workers will be made available and sent out. So what do you need to do when you come across the problem? All right, let's try that again. I heard like two people say it. The answer is pray. All right, here we go. What do you need to do when you encounter a problem? Yes, thank you. You need to pray about it. Jesus tells that to the disciples right here, right? He's talking about all these things he's doing. He's going from city to city. He's preaching the good news. He's, he's curing diseases and sickness. He saw a large crowd that, he saw this large crowd that was helpless and without a shepherd. The harvest is ready. And he tells the disciples to take a moment to stop and to pray. But then in that very next moment, what does Jesus do? He calls the 12 disciples to him, which we get named here in the Gospel of Matthew, which if you look in Mark and Luke and John, they're different lists. The names are not the same. It's the number that's important. Why is it 12? Confirmation students? Why is it 12? I heard somebody say it. You're not a confirmation student. <laughs> the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. And, and, is, and are the 12 tribes of Israel listed the exact same way every time they're listed in the Old Testament? No, they're not, actually. Which is why it doesn't matter that the 12 apostles or disciples are not listed the same either. Because they might have had different, gone by different names. And that's okay. Let's not get hung up on that. But the moment after Jesus tells the disciples to pray that God would send out workers for the harvest, he calls together the 12 disciples. And what does he do? What does he do? I heard you say it earlier. What does he do? He he sends them out, right? He tells them to go. He gave them all authority over unclean spirits to cast out demons, to cure every disease and every sickness. Well, how doesn't that sound familiar? Jesus was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. And now he just called together the 12 disciples and he gave them authority over unclean spirits and the power to cure every disease and every sickness. He just gave the disciples the same power that he himself was using to do the very things that he was doing. And he calls them and he sends them out. And these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no towns of Samaria, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers and cast out demons. 
How many of you are ready to go do that? Because that's what Jesus calls each and every one of us to do. The first thing that struck me about this text, though, was that very first line. Jesus sent out his disciples after he saw the large crowd and was teaching them. He sent them out and he said, go nowhere amongst the Gentiles or no town of Samaria, but go to the lost sheep of Israel. Why not go to the Gentiles? Why not go to Samaria? Why only to the lost sheep of Israel? Who as Christians are we supposed to make sure hears the message? All people, everyone. So as a congregation, we should be out evangelizing everyone to come and join our congregation, right? Yeah, this this means yes. I was I know I've been gone. I wasn't here last week. I know, but you go. Yeah, I shouldn't have forgotten that this is participatory. So, right? This means yes. This means no. So, as a congregation, we need to be out telling everybody the message about and in, inviting all of those people to come to worship here. Right? No. Yes, you're right. We are supposed to be telling everybody that, that God has called us and, and wants everyone to know this message. But can we as a congregation possibly make sure that everybody hears the message? No, we can't. And that's why Jesus sent the disciples only to the lost sheep of Israel. Right? Because the lost sheep of Israel are people that they have stuff in common with. That they have... Things that they can use to talk to them about. They have avenues to start discussions. They have ways to be a part of their lives. They already have things in common because of the fact that they are both Jewish. They are both belong to the same nation. They have something in common. And therefore a place to start. Rick Warren in the Purpose Driven Church said, this is a quote, too many congregations are naive in their thinking about evangelism. If you ask the members, who is the church trying to reach for Christ? The response will likely be everybody. We're trying to reach the entire world for Jesus Christ. Of course, this is the goal of the Great Commission, and it should be the prayer of every church. But in practice, there is not a local church anywhere that can reach everybody. And he continues on on a different page. I believe that the most effective even Evangel- evangelistic, sorry. I believe that the most effective evangelistic strategy is to first try to reach those with whom you are already have something in common. And after you've discovered all possible target groups in your community, which group should you focus on first? And the answer is to go after those who are most likely to be reached. Jesus didn't say don't go to the Gentiles and the Samaritans because he didn't want them to have the message. He wanted the disciples to go someplace that people were actually going to be connected with the message. And then he continued to tell them that if you go someplace and they don't listen, what are you supposed to do? What? Move on. on. Don't get hung up on the fact that they don't want to listen to the message. Because it's not our job to convert anybody. That should make all of us feel a little bit easier. Your job is to share the good news. Your job is to tell other people what God has done for you. Your job is to tell people how much God loves you and what God has done for everyone. And if they don't want to listen, okay, let's talk about something else then. But don't waste your time and energy trying to tell them something that they're not going to listen to. Why? Because that's only going to... um, Make you feel like you haven't done what you're supposed to do, right? Because you, you didn't reach somebody. And it's going to annoy them and probably drive them further away from the church. You've planted a seed. There's a, there's a section where Paul talks about those who have been baptized by him or others. And it says, and I planted the seed and Barnabas watered and God brought the growth, right? It's not about us bringing anybody to God. Because if we remember what Martin Luther said about the third part of the Apostles' Creed, right? I believe in God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Martin Luther said, I cannot by my own power or or understanding come to believe in Jesus Christ except through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's God working in and through us that helps us 
to come to know who God is. And you might be someone who plants that seed. You might be someone that shows someone how much God loves them. And then God can work in and through that. But if they don't listen, shake the dust off your feet and move on. We have too much conflict in the world. Don't be the cause of some of it. Because we are here to show how much God loves each and every one of us. Right? Cure the sick. What does he say? Cure the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. That's what God has called you to do. To cure the sick. To raise the dead. To cleanse the lepers. And to cast out demons. He's sending you out as God sent him. So know that he loves you and he goes with you. Sending you on your way to do the things that he himself came to do. And as I end here this morning, I have a one quote from Friar James Martin. It's from one of his books. I have no idea which book it's from. Um... But the quote is, when observed cleansing the wounds of a leper, a man once said to Mother Teresa, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. To which she replied, neither would I. But I would gladly do it for Christ. What are you willing to do for Jesus? Because I, like Mother Teresa, would also not cleanse the wounds of a leper for a million dollars. But it is something that we all should do for Christ.